Well, welcome everybody to the 4th of July weekend. We're so glad you joined us online at River Point and West End Church. The 4th of July weekend is kind of a different weekend this year, isn't it? There's not a lot of big fireworks things and, you know, it's just kind of different this year. But it's a great time to talk about freedom uh, because it's the celebration of our nation's birth and uh, an independence. And so I wanted to talk about freedom because freedom is such a big part of the Christian experience. In fact, if you don't understand what it is about freedom, then uh, you don't really understand what God came to do when he sent his son Jesus to the earth. I mean, he came to make us free. So we're in this series called Music to My Ears. And I think one of the phrases that we should hear from God that should be music to our ears is, you are free. You may not know this or not, but I grew up on a, a prison farm in Fort Worth, Texas. My stepfather was a warden of a federal penitentiary, and we grew up on a prison. And it was a federal prison, so the outside of the uh, all the housing where we lived, as well as the institution where the prisoners were held, was all encompassed by a big fence and guardhouses and gates. Now, the difference was we'd have trustees from the prison come down and mow our grass. They always wore all white. And as a kid, I remember asking them, what did you do? Which I don't think you're supposed to ask people that, but I did. But it was a federal prison. It was minimum security. So it was a lot of tax evasion, which as a kid, I didn't really understand what that was. Here was the fundamental difference. I could get in the car with my mom or even ride my bike. And I could go outside the prison gate and go down the street to the store. The guys in the white suits, they couldn't. They were confined. And so I understood from kind of an early age, hey, this is, uh, this is different. My life is different because I'm free than those people who are not. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but the, the Christian gospel is really, the, this, this, this ideal is the beginning of the ideal of freedom. In the ancient Greek democracy, it was confined to a handful of elite citizens. In fact, famous people that you've heard of, Plato and Aristotle, they believed that most people were born to be slaves. And it was only when Jesus showed up that says, no, freedom is for everybody. In this very remote corner of the Roman Empire, this teacher, Jesus, the savior of the world came and said crazy things like this. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. We're gonna talk about that. In the words of Paul, who said, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Now we read that and we find it somewhat, um, you know, some sort of n novel idea, but this is really music to the ears of those in the first century because freedom wasn't taken for granted. Most people were not free. And the Roman government was so oppressive, so oppressive that nobody felt free, especially if you were Jewish. So let's talk about freedom for just a minute. And because uh, I want you to leave here this time together uh, feeling uh, excited about your relationship with God. I, wa I want you to leave here with full of faith, believing that you are indeed free. I want you to understand that a little bit better. God wants us to know about freedom. And there's a couple of different types of freedom I'm gonna briefly mention today. One is the freedom from religion. Now, you may not know about this, but, but, but religion can actually be a ball and chain around your ankle that keeps you from experiencing freedom. It will keep you, it can keep you, even Christian religion, when it gets out of hand, this idea is it keeps you from real freedom. The Apostle Paul addressed this in, in, when he wrote this letter to a region of churches called Galatia. And he wrote this and he says, listen, they were having all these problems. Let me read you the verse and I'll explain it to you. It says, so Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure, here's the warning, make sure that, no, that you stay free, that no one takes you captive, right? So now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in the slavery of the law. Listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. Now, what in the world is Paul talking about here? Well, in that day, in that region, these Gentile, non-Jewish people were coming to believe that Jesus was the Savior of the world. They placed their faith in Christ, that he died for their sins, he was buried, 
Then he rose again. And they were converting to Christianity from all kinds of different pagan and idol worship, all these pagan religions. Well, the Jewish folks uh, who were also followers of Christ heard about this. And they, they, they had a lot of controversy about this, but they, they came to those Gentile Christians and said, well, you can become a Christian and you can follow Jesus, but you first have to be Jewish. In other words, what you have to do is you have to come through the doorway of Judaism in order to get to Jesus, that Jesus came for the Jews. And Paul, who was a Jew among Jews, I mean, he had a high-ranking Jewish job. He was a Jewish zealot. In fact, he per before he believed in Jesus, he persecuted Christians. And he's writing this letter and he's saying to them, don't let religious people take you captive. Don't let them do it. In other words, you don't have to become Jewish in order to follow Jesus. It's okay if you are Jewish, but you don't have to be Jewish. And it was so strange. Here's how powerful tradition is. The Jewish people were telling these Gentiles that they have to adhere to the Jewish diet, the Jewish calendar, the true Jewish festivals, and that men, grown men, had to go through the Jewish rite of circumcision, which is for infant boys, in order to really be acceptable to God. And uh, men were doing it. And Paul heard about this and said, this is nonsense. This is religion. This isn't faith. This isn't Christ. This isn't grace. And I, I just uh, realized in my own life, there are plenty of religious people in the in, in our life that try to hold us captive to what you've got to be doing to be acceptable to your creator. In the first century, it was the same way. They were saying, they were trying to add to the gospel of Jesus Christ, all this re religious tradition. And Jesus, I mean, and Paul was warning them not to stray away from the gospel of Jesus. In fact, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. He says, listen, be careful not to think that you, your good acts and your good works and you're keeping the rules and you being religious can make you acceptable to God. In fact, he writes in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it is by grace that you've been saved and forgiven, right? It's through, it's right, through faith. And then he says this very clearly, listen, this is where we lose it. This is not from yourselves, this salvation, this right standing with your creator, it's a gift of God. It's not by works so that you can't boast about it. You know what religion does? When you are a rule keeper and you go to church and you're really good with it, it really puffs you up with arrogance and pride. You feel better than other people because you're doing what you believe God would expect or God requires in order for you to be acceptable. And when you do that, you, you can't hardly think about other people that aren't doing the same things sort of in a degrading way or, or uh, uh, they're less valuable or they're not doing right and you become what's called judgmental. And religious people, church people, Christian people are terrible about this. And that's exactly what these Jewish uh, religious leaders were doing. They're saying, hey, we got circumcised, you get circumcised. I'm going through it, you go through it. We don't eat um, you know, shellfish, you don't eat shellfish. We don't eat pork, you don't eat pork. And they were being judged. And it totally takes away from Jesus Christ and the price he paid on the cross. This is how powerful tradition and religion is. And some of you know about this because you grew up in a church like this that you showed up at church every week and because you showed up at church every week, they were telling you what to do and you were trying to be a good boy or good girl and do all the things and you couldn't hardly help looking at other people sort of down your nose saying, well, you know, they're, they're having more fun than we are, but we're keeping all the rules. And Jesus opened a brand new commandment to us. He said, listen, that we're, we're supposed to love one another and that if we receive God's grace by faith, believing that Jesus died for ourselves, we can't take credit for earning our way to God. In fact, every other religion of the world is about you or a person earning their way to God. Christianity is the only one that says that God made his way to you and he gave you this gift. So how you look at salvation is really, really important. Do you look at it as a gift from God to receive uh, grace 
or do you look at it as a reward? Because if you look at it as a reward, you're going to try to earn that reward, that payday. That's going to be important to you. But if you look at it as grace, it's going to be compelling to you to live a life of love. That your relationship with God isn't about earning something, but because you have something, you're able to live freely. We have the gospel of grace, not the gospel of works. So the difference in understanding this is night and day. One will put you in bondage to religion and works, and the other will give you freedom. And when Jesus says, I've come to give you freedom, right? He he came to talk about the fact that we're free from earning. There's no cause and effect idea anymore. We receive a gift by faith that Jesus died for our sins and we are free. And everything, listen to me, everything's been taken care of. Everything. You don't have to do anything else in order to be accepted by God. Receive this gift. And the reality is you're so touched by God's compassion for you, it will cause you to live differently. Receiving this gift for eternity allows you to live this life on earth completely differently. Now, John 8 says it this way. That this is a different kind of uh, deal. He says this, um, and you know the truth, Jesus is saying to, to uh, Jewish people, and the truth, right, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Famous passage, right? And then the answer was, but we are descendants of Abraham, they said. And we have never been slaves to anyone. Well, that wasn't true. They were slaves in Egypt. So what are you talking about here? But what do you mean we'll set you free? And this is kind of the relationship that we have, that we don't recognize that we are captive by something. And Jesus replied to them, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. So if the son sets you free, then you are truly free or you are free indeed. So the other kind of freedom is not just a freedom from a works mentality that makes you acceptable God, but we are free from sin. We are free from the condemnation of sin and we are free from the power of sin. We often are slaves to something that we don't really understand. And we tend to think that freedom has has this definition. Freedom is being able to do whatever I want to do. That's freedom. Well, that's not real freedom. That's being a slave to your desires. I think real freedom is about not having to do the things I want to do. That's freedom. Freedom is about a life where we can rise above our desires and rise above our passions and rise above our addictions so that we don't have to do what we want to do, that we're not driven or held captive by our desires, that we're free not to live a life of sin because of the power of the Holy Spirit, which dwells within us. Now, maybe, maybe you're a person that doesn't even believe in Jesus, right? And you believe that freedom is about just exercising your free will and you feel like you're free. But the reality is you, you, you have to have this power that's bigger than yourselves in order to live the life that you really want to live. To be fully free, you must have the desire, the ability, and the opportunity to do what makes us happy, right? And and we, we have the opportunity or we have the ability, but, do we, but the desire is the thing that's driving us. So to be happy forever, our sins must not only be forgiven, but we must be released from the power of sin, right? And God's wrath has to be removed so we can live freely, that we don't have to fear punishment. This is why Jesus referred to himself as the truth will set you free. And then he refers to himself as I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Christ gives us freedom. There's no condemnation in Christ. Now, this is important because if you're living a life of shame or guilt, then then all of a sudden that shame and guilt holds us as a prisoner in life. We just always feel like we're not good enough. And we we, we don't really understand or see We don't really understand or see the power of what God's provided for us. He's provided us freedom. So Christ gives us freedom. There's no condemnation. So that allows us to live. I'm not living 
to try to earn something. Listen, any kind of performance-based relationship is dysfunctional at its core. If I have to do something to earn your love and earn your affection, listen, I've said this many times before, then it's not gonna have intimacy in it. And God took away all the condemnation that when we die and go to heaven, he's not gonna judge whether we get into heaven or not based upon our performance or our merits. He's gonna say, did you believe in the Savior? And he's gonna see us as perfect and holy, a saint. And we get to have eternal life, not because of our good works or, um, or we don't get sent to hell because of our bad works. It's the idea that we either are forgiven or we are not forgiven. Romans 8 says it this way. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now we're told to confess our sins. We're told to confess our sins so that we don't carry around this, that we agree with God. That's what confession is. You just agree with God, right? They say, God, I know this was out of bounds. I know this was dysfunctional. I know this was wrong. I know this was sin. And I just want to confess this to you uh, because I want to be honest and I'm transparent with you. I don't want to have any secrets from you. And God allows us to be free. We're forgiven for that sin. But when we confess that sin, we're able to walk away and say, God knows this all and forgives us for sure. In fact, because we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, we're able to live a life where we don't have to do everything we want to do. In fact, Paul says it this way, the temptations in your life are no different than from other people's experience. We are, what's common to every single one of us is that we're all tempted to do wrong. And God is faithful, Paul says. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. So we don't have to do the thing that we don't want to do. And we can do the thing that we really want to do. So, you know, this ideal of freedom here on July 4th is this ideal that I am really free to exercise my will to follow God. And that I'm not trapped by religion trying to earn acceptance. And I'm not trapped by sin, condemned by shame. That Christ has really set me free. The truth set me free and I'm free indeed. Boy, I I hope you feel that today. I hope you can experience that today. This, This idea that there's a freedom there. Paul warns us that we shouldn't use our freedom to indulge the desires of the flesh. This is an idea that I'm forgiven, so it doesn't matter. It's the idea that I'm forgiven and I'm so touched. It's music to my ears. I'm free. I'm not going to be condemned for my behavior or for my choices. That Christ has took the punishment for my life, for my sin. And I'm going to live forever with him in heaven because of him, not because of me. That should be should be so compelling to you and me that it causes us to live differently. Not to earn something, but because we already have something. Uh, this, this freedom shouldn't be taken for granted. We should really have it to be music to our ears that Christ has set us free. So if you're listening today and you feel like you are not free, that you're trying to earn some uh, somebody's acceptance or God's acceptance. I just want to encourage you to pursue a healthier way, to get in touch with the truth because the truth will set you free. And if you're living a life of shame, you've made some bad mistakes today and you've con- gone your own way and you, you feel condemned, I want you to just be honest with God about that and unload that burden to him. And I want you to say, God, take my shame. Take my guilt. I want to be free. And believe that Jesus Christ died for all the things you've done, are doing, and will do. And enjoy the freedom that God has provided for you in Christ. And I also want us to experience this idea that we're all the same. That we're all tempted. That people make mistakes. Sin happens. And none of us have arrived. So I don't want to be that Jewish Pharisee that creates this religious hurdles that I can jump over and I judge other people who can't. I want to treat other people with such grace because I have freedom. 
I, I want to treat other people with equality, that we're all the same, so that we can experience freedom. I don't want to be puffed up with arrogance by keeping the rules. What I want to do is extend grace and mercy to others. So on this July 4th weekend, I hope you feel free, free indeed. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for freedom. We don't want to be bound. We don't want our church to be a religious institution where people feel like they have to continually do something to earn your acceptance. I want our people and I want our community to experience the freedom that's found in you. Freedom to be forgiven. Freedom to live a life that's not driven just by our desires or our, our uh, instincts, but be driven by you. Freedom from religion where we have to perform in a certain way to be acceptable to you, that we can just enjoy this gift of salvation by grace and we can experience your mercy and love in a way that allows us to feel, um, to treat other people with the same amount of love and compassion, that we would be kind and compassionate to other people because we are free free indeed. And I pray for those today that are watching that you would, if you've never given your life to Christ, boy, this is the perfect time to do that. On this July 4th weekend, just give your life to Christ. Say, God, forgive me. I believe Jesus did die for my sins and was raised again, and I want to follow you. That simple prayer begins a beautiful relationship of freedom. God, thank you for grace. In Jesus' name, amen.